associated with use of this rooms because of summer uh, classes here. And um, as I've noted, we've had to um, repeatedly constrain our coverage of certain material um, because of the small amount of time available. And um, uh, this afternoon, and particularly the first part of this afternoon, um, uh, is uh, perhaps the biggest sort of um, case where we've had to really almost cut off Procrusty's legs to fit him on the table. Um, uh, as unpleasant as that surgical image is. Um, and um, the, the plan is for me to try to convey to those here some elements of the variegated um, uh, opportunities uh, and challenges um, associated with analysis of the sort of data that we collect through Ethica. Um, now, this analysis and use of sophisticated tools for this analysis goes back to the very inception of my work with these techniques back at MIT in 2003 or so. And, and, and I was always motivated by the desire to secure uh, extra levels of insight from the data collected using smartphones, wearables, um, or, um, or, or mobile devices. Back that time, it was before smartphones in, the, in any sense that we know them today existed. Um, and uh, to, to gain that level of extra insight, my conviction was that um, one would need to leverage the voluminous data uh, coming in with models of some sort. As uh, epidemiologist Phil Zuckerman said once, um, models without data are myth and data without models is madness and uh, my conviction was that um, that modeling in its varied forms uh, it's, a, it's a quite broad term in its um, delineation of methods um, was absolutely essential to to make, uh, to reach the, the greatest potential of these, uh, the sorts of data we're, we're collecting today via Ethica. And um, over the years um, of uh, our work and the systems that led up to Ethica but were totally rewritten for Ethica uh, by Mohammed and now Mohammed and, and uh, colleagues, um, uh, there have been a, a flowering of different approaches used with these techniques varying from dynamic modeling, simulation modeling, uh, agent-based uh, system dynamics and character, um, uh, thinking a great deal about how to mesh it with uh, discrete event modeling, um, to aspects of machine learning, computational statistics, um, uh, use of uh, techniques like recurrent events analysis and time to event analysis, um, linear regression, you know, wide, wide variety of techniques and visualization techniques um, to make use of this data. And uh, that's led to numer numerous publications. It's also led to a wide variety of example models um, that illustrate some of these principles, which, you know, if people here were interested, I'd be glad to, to share with you and show you. And indeed, um, uh, while this presentation is just the first part of the afternoon, and I have to limit it to, um, to a little bit under two hours uh, for that reason, um, so we can get on to project work. Um, if anyone's interested in taking me aside and saying, look, I'm really interested in this thing you talked about. I'm really interested in how we understand the underlying state of a person with respect to whether they're indoors or outdoors, or if they're carrying the phone or not, or, or um, how, you, how you mesh dynamic network data with dynamic models, like an agent-based model that simulates a contact network. Um, pull me aside. I could deliver, if there were interest, whole lectures on those topics, and I have a lot of material. 
So I'm going to have to apologize. I'm going to go in a whirlwind way through some material. I'm going to provide you the slides so you're not limited to the whirlwind for exploring it. Um, but please pull me aside if you want to go deeper on any of these topics. I am absolutely half, uh, delighted to. And some of the papers whose references I shared with you have a good explication of those techniques. Others have been well explored by students who have served as TAs here. Um, for example, classifying smoking behavior through uh, Chen Yang, or um, Bo Pu and Alex. Why is, why is that all the students I mentioned? <laughs> Gone. <laughs> um, maybe they're working on them to advance these techniques. You know? um, maybe they're still in Marcus. Um, but uh, her working on, um, or, or, or um, Bo Pu worked on cough classification together with Alex. Um, uh, and Aiden, Aiden Tehui, actually, Alex worked on uh, additional audio classification um, uh, related to, uh, to other respiratory distress. Um, but the point is, there's a lot of substance in terms of our background in this. And I think it's where a lot of things get quite fun in terms of getting insights from this data. It's by combining with the data with models that are, are well designed. But I'm going to only be able to provide you a glimpse of this. But a glimpse in slides, OK? Um, and you'll find videos of me um, talking about it uh, online in, in greater detail as well. But it would be better to engage one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Um, OK. Um, I wanted to start by actually pointing just to a set of slides um, related to the interface of sensors to this issue of of analysis and indeed the issue of study design. Um, Ethica is a very rich platform for self-reporting. It's a very rich platform for flexible self-reporting. Self-reporting that um, can be triggered by a button. You saw Mohammed today for te study testing. He actually had certain surveys which might normally be triggered as ecological momentary assessments for ex experience sampling once a day at random times. But he, he, he also wired up a button so that when you push the button, it would trigger that survey for the sake of testing, right? Um, and uh, Ethica is this, you know, a, a really large and rich set of methods um, for, for building surveys, whether skip patterns, criteria, um, having one survey depend on the results, answers from another survey, and, um, and in terms of question types, multimedia, um, you know, more narrative questions, etc., that are really rich. But sensors are a key part of it. Now, I, I argued uh, from this floor uh, a couple days ago that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. The sensors actually enable more judicious timing of the um, of the of the uh, questionnaires uh, asked to people, and they lend context to it. Um, uh, there's also a set of um, analyses we can conduct with sensors that that lend a special uh, understanding. Um, and I'm going to briefly introduce you to um, a set of uses of, understand, of, of uh, sensors here um, uh, that can be useful in studies. One is uh, sensor data, data to tag the contents of the EMAs and, and questionnaires. You saw a little bit of this Mohammed's presentation earlier today where it showed that map. This is something built into Ethica where you could have EMA responses, responses to these micro questionnaires be situated on the map and you'd see where they answered certain things. Um, so where they reported tobacco-based advertising, for example, or where they encountered a barrier to physical activity, such as a closed, closed door, right? Um, that could be situated uh, on a map. Um, uh, we can also capture through Beacon something about social context. Um, if we have a network of people who are uh, peers and mix with each other, we might be able to understand something about social context. Or you might ask questions which elicit that social context, like are you at a party or at home or, 
or what have you, or be able to deduce it from their GPS location. Um, uh, you, might, you might sense the proximity of resources, like when this veteran experienced a flashback, how close was their service dog? Or when was the last time they saw the service dog as judged through sensor-based mechanisms, through the, the collar um, that carried the beacon for the service dog? We, we would know, okay, um, the last time the veteran is judged through the phone was in the ear of the dog is judged through the beacon on its collar was such and such a time. Um, and that might be, uh, you know, useful for understanding some of the context of a, a flashback, for example. Um, uh, or we might inter be interested in knowing was this EMA answered indoor or outdoor, the level of physical activity, um, or whether it was an, uh, answered in a, in a moving vehicle. In other cases, I argued sensor data is useful by triggering uh, ecological momentary assessments. Um, I won't go into this because it's something I've noted before, but um, it's a useful uh, mechanism um, and it can, ha it can have trade-offs associated with it, but uh, really allow for lessening recall bias and enhancing response rates through relevant queries. Uh, another thing that we can use sensors for is collecting time aggregate measures um, that are, are helpful for interpreting things. So one we've done a lot of work with is mobility entropy. We've tried to also do quite a bit of work about poo and level of physical activity. Um, step counts are an obvious thing there, but he's actually tried working with some of the accelerometer data not really finding a lot of extra insight beyond what we got through step counts, interestingly. Um, fraction of time sedentary and cumulative time outside. These are things which, you know, might be measures of a person's experience across the study or for a given day that might lend understanding of some of their other behavior, say in the course of the day, um, uh, their level, their affect, their mood, um, et cetera. Um, and time ag aggregated data form, the, the desire for these, the desire to compute them, these metrics, these indices or, or exposure measures or, or um, summaries of, of you know, some, some sort of uh, behavior over the course of the day or exposure. Indeed, this motivates a lot of our analysis. Um, so, for example, we, we might compute their cumulative contact hours with other participants or with their service dog. Um, um, the amount of hours in moderate to vigorous physical activity, the number of step, step counts per day for a given time, or indeed, as computed by Fitbit, perhaps, or by other wristwatches, aspects of their sleep quality um, uh, with the limitations um, it, that it provides as well. And then some amount of exposure, you know, for example, exposure to air pollution um, or their presence near a billboard promoting tobacco use or promoting fast food or their exposure to parks. For in epidemiology and population health, we've long lived with fairly coarse grain measures of, of such exposures, right? We've We've judged from someone's living location how much exposure they have to parks, for example, to green space, or to an adverse physical environment, or indeed to a uh, adverse food environment. You know, they live near convenience stores in a food desert, um, and the nearest grocery store to where they live is, you know, two miles away. Um, um, but. Some of our earliest work led um, none other than by a um, young and energetic Mohammed Hashemian um, involved taking data from patterns of sensor recording uh, associated with participants and looking at their actual activity spaces. By their activity space, I mean, where did they actually circulate day to day? Sometimes it's called, I think, a geography life spaces. But the idea is, you know, I, I live in a certain location, but I traverse the city, um, you know, to, to go from perhaps home to work or to go from home 
to child care location to you know to uh, shopping etc and that life space turns out to often run close to certain resources that you might not judge just from the home location and sometimes judging those resources is valuable um, you you recognize for example that this is a person who who does have some measure of contact with um, a better food environment because of where they work each day or or the route that they take to and fro uh, from work um, on on the bus and Mohammed actually um, boiled uh, using a, a database on mapping of services of various sorts to uh, GPS uh, to GIS locations Mohammed reasoned about the level of exposure people had to different resources from a, a social determinants perspective. Um, uh, another, another use of, of uh, sensor data here is for um, temporally fine-grained um, uh, measures, um, measures that are, are finer grained, um, finer grained but, um, uh, but are useful for, for reasoning about their temporally limited exposures and subsequent outcomes. Um, so some measures here um, include, for example, um, uh, contact patterns over a certain uh, period of time. Um, or uh, they engaged in, um, in movements within the course of a given day that may have exposed them based on Enterococcus counts from the surf for that region of Newport Beach or Huntington Beach for that day that exposed them to certain uh, levels of indicator organisms that might um, might pose them at risk of of, of gastrointestinal distress, um, uh, or they're exposed to certain particulate levels because of their traversal of the given area. Um, uh, these are, are useful measures, um, uh, and uh, some of them are they're defined by being more uh, temporally fine-grained. We might do it for a day or you know, a week, but we use this sensor data to link often with external data like weather, um, uh, levels of particulate matter and air quality, um, uh, levels of uh, water quality. Um, uh, et cetera, and we, we thereby capture exposure measures. Um, very useful, quite practical, especially if you then ask about how is this related to occurrence of COPD exacerbations or, or outcomes in terms of respiratory distress or highly credible gastrointestinal illness as reported by uh, instruments such as Cheryl used in her foodborne illness study. Um, so, so here we have sort of, for certain periods of time, judging data, some sort of exposure measures, and we may be looking at, at outcomes in the short, me in the short term. Um, these time aggregated sensor data might be more general. It will be, for example, we have some quite interesting work um, uh, that sounds immodest, I, I shouldn't say it. I, I was fascinated by it. But it appears in quite a few journals now on um, mobility entropy. The idea here is using sensor measurements. We use mobility, but that's, that's actually not essential to the method. To judge predictability of people's lives in terms of their circulation patterns. Now, the reason I emphasize mobility is not essential you could do similar things for physical activity, or you could do similar things for contact patterns. The point of it was how, how regular are the patterns in people's lives? To what degree are their lives tightly regimented by what goes on each day? To what degree is it totally entropic? Um, you know, uh, regimented might be they're in a, a hospital, um, hospital room, and, and they're, they're not only confined most of the time, but their doings and froings are very confined to that ward or something like that. Uh, maybe it's a, a dementia ward where they're restricted, where they can travel. Um, by contrast, someone who's homeless 
might have a predictability index that's extremely low. They're couch surfing here. They're going catch as catch can to different um, uh, to different uh, locations for for their um, shelter. You know, on different nights. Uh, sometimes they're sleeping out in the street, and um, there they have a very low predictability, which psychologically is also, you know, quite unhealthy. Quite unhealthy to not know where you're going to be eating that night, right? Um, where you're going to be sleeping, and um, you can imagine transitions in this uh, associated with important life events. Um, uh, the horrendous phenomena of domestic violence, for example, might lead to a, a, a comparatively um, structured uh, schedule to one that's, you know, very, very difficult to, to produce. Transition to unemployment or, or, or homelessness might be associated with these. So one of the, the reasons we compute measures like that is to link it with clinical factors. So, for example, for patients with HIV AIDS um, who suffer different levels of, ch of different types of challenge with respect to remaining on their, their, their heart medications that are so critical for them and for others um, to reduce risk of transmission. In the course of, uh, I'm told by HIV physicians with whom we work closely um, that um, one of the big um, challenges for a clinician when they meet an HIV AIDS patient is trying to understand the level of, of, um, of disorder and distress and, and regularity in this person's life. The, the recognition being that someone who has a very regular pattern, set routines, very predictable, they might be able to give, for example, pills for, for a longer period of time. Someone who is totally discombobulated, doesn't know where they're going to get their meal, will often have a hard time, understandably, staying current with those pills and maybe even keeping them on their person, particularly if they're struggling with intoxication or, or, or other challenges cognitively, uh, mental health challenges. And so there you might uh, ask them to pick up their medication at a methadone clinic where they present anyway, daily or asked to see them every week as a clinician, which indeed goes on for some of the HIV clinicians, including the one we work with. So he was very interested in Ethica as a way to sort of give a fingerprint of function, as it were, for a person. That's Jenny Basrin's term, but, but um, for, for more elderly patients. But to give a fingerprint of uh, salient patterns in that person's life, predictability, which is such an important human, you know, human, um, um, uh, concept, but one that it's hard to, to pin down just from looking at traditional clinical measures, or indeed for looking at their self-report, because what's less predictable for me may seem more predictable for you, or what have you. And so um, entropy measures provide us a way of sort of getting, getting salient numbers for level of predictability of someone's life patterns in a way that we could then use, maybe in a regression, to look at associations, maybe in a uh, clinical context to find associations with outcome measures, um, with ability to stay connected with the clinician. And we can use that as a, as a characteristic of the person. It's a proxy measure. It's imperfect. But it may be a lot better than what we're dealing with right now, which is guesswork and you know, intuition based on a meeting. At the least, you know, um, one could benefit from some additional features. So, so what this clinician was hoping is, you know, Ethica could, could help provide those measures. And we've explored those measures well in the literature and found, uh, found them very um, helpful in certain, certain spheres. Um, and, and actually quite, uh, quite, quite general. Um, and we have code bases for these things. Okay. Um, I, I commented here on, um, on some measures that one can use with sensor data because, you know, with Ethica, it's always easy to, to say, wow, there's, there's all this, this sensor stuff, you know. Uh, it came up this morning, right, battery. Like, you know, what about a battery, you know, um, or location or physical proximity, or um, level of, of, of sex, right? uh, or where does that fit in 
to this picture of these rich self-reports we can get from, from Ethica as well, which are, are very valuable. I would argue that they're not two solitudes. It's not that one doesn't inform the other, that you know, it's all about, it's all about um, at the basic level, just about surveys, and, and then the sensor stuff is, is you know, for the geeks like me, um, you know, who, who would like to go into a closet and program you know, for 36 hours straight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I get Mohammed would like to employ me for that. Um, so um, no, it's not a matter of that. What I'm saying is this sensor data can actually help us by triggering EMAs, give context to the EMAs we do see, what was going on at the time they reported uh, psychosocial distress, what was going on at the time that they reported a period of being unable to keep up with their medication as an HIV patient. Maybe that was a period of great, you know, unpredictability. Um, uh, maybe it's in terms of of outcomes that they that they report with their survey instruments involving coughing and wheezing, involving uh, shortness of breath, um, other aspects of respiratory distress. You can put it into a context of exposures a context of, um, of, of, of uh, geographic situation and, um, and exposures to local, um, uh, local risk factors and physical activity and even something here in Saskatchewan. Um, uh, we have this thing called uh, winter um, and, and, it's, and it's white and there's co it's cold. Um, and in as much as that might be associated with exacerbations, weather data even might, might um, you might use it to, to reason about why a child is suffering from an asthmatic attack at certain times, or why an individual uh, working uh, in uh, risk-prone uh, risk environments like feed barns together with, um, with uh, exposure to the cold and, um, and going indoors and outdoors, you know, what, what things might be most defining for this person and triggering those patterns. And indeed, with recurrent events analysis, analysis like that, you can look at those associations and try to figure out which of them is the strongest um, measure, strongest uh, uh, predictor, you know, of outcome. So it's not, that, it's not that sensor data is a solitude separate from, from self-reporting. The two, I would argue, work together to lend value to each other. Um, without self-reporting, the sensor data would lack clear meaning. It would be disconnected. We wouldn't know how to interpret it sometimes. Without the, the sensor data, the self-reporting loses a lot of its potential. Okay? Some, some comments there. This points to some analysis priorities that I'll be talking about here. I will share all these slides with you. I recognize that I do you a disservice by uh, going through them in such an abbreviated way, but it is to provide us with that, um, uh, with that extra time for other tasks, um, particularly the, the project time. Okay, so those were some, some comments on sensor data. I think with your leave,